Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I'm back today with my 11th conversation with you about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Now, if you have watched my 10th lecture, or all the other ones, um, you know that we had reached a point in our reading where Freire is trying to discuss the internal violence amongst the oppressed. Why do they turn on each other or are oppressive to each other? Why do the instances of domestic violence increase in colonized situations? And that is where he starts on page 62, and uh, he starts explaining that. Right, uh, It's still based in his clear understanding of the construction of the native self, of peasants' identity and other oppressed groups within the logical system of oppression created by the oppressors. Right, And what's interesting to note is that he starts this discussion with the work of Fanon. And so uh, the first quote that I'll read to you from the book is actually a direct quotation from The Wretched of the Earth. Uh, so we'll go to my reading of page 62 and 63, middle of 63, and then I'll come back and talk about it a little more. So here we go. The colonized man will first manifest this aggressiveness which has been deposited in his bones against his own people. This is the period when the Negroes beat each other up and the policies, police and magistrates do not know which way to turn when faced with the astonishing waves of crime in North Africa. While the settler or the policeman has the right the livelong day to strike the native, to insult him and to make him crawl to them, you will see the native reaching for his knife at the slightest hostile or aggressive glance cast on him by another native. For the last resort of the native is to defend his personality vis-a-vis -vis his brother. It is possible that in this behavior they are once more manifesting their duality because the oppressor exists within their oppressed comrades. When they attack those comrades, they are indirectly attacking the oppressor as well. On the other hand, at a certain point in their existential experience, the oppressed feel an irresistible attraction towards the oppressors and their way of life. Sharing this way of life becomes an overpowering aspiration. In their alienation, the oppressed want at any cost to resemble the oppressors, to imitate them, to follow them. This phenomena is especially prevalent in the middle class oppressed, who yearn to be equal to the eminent men and women of upper class. Albert Memmi, in an exceptional analysis of the colonized mentality, refers to the contempt he felt towards the colonizer mixed with passionate attraction towards him. How could the colonizer look after his workers while periodically gunning down a crowd of colonized? How could the colonized deny himself so cruelly yet make such excessive demands? Self-deception is an, uh, sorry. How could he hate the colonizers and yet admire them so passionately? I too felt this admiration in spite of myself. That's Albert Memmi. Self-depreciation is another characteristic of the oppressed, which derives from their internalization of the opinion the oppressors hold of them. So often do they hear that they are good for nothing, know nothing, and are incapable of learning anything, that they are sick, lazy, and unproductive, that in the end they become convinced of their own unfitness. The peasant feels inferior to the boss because the boss seems to be the only one who knows things and is able to run things. They call themselves ignorant and say the professor is the one who has knowledge and to whom they should listen. The criteria of knowledge imposed upon them are the conventional ones. Why don't you, said a peasant, peasant participating in a culture circle, circle, explain the pictures first. That will, it will take less time and won't give us a headache. Almost never do they realize that they too know things. 
they have learned in their relations with the world and with other women and men. Given the circumstances which have produced their duality, it is only natural that they distrust themselves. Not infrequently, peasants in educational projects begin to discuss a generative theme in a lively manner, then stop suddenly and say to the edu educator, excuse us, we are, ought to keep quiet and let you talk. You're the one who knows. We don't know anything. They often insist that there is no difference between them and the animals. When they do admit of difference, it favors the animals. They are freer than we are. So as you can see in this reading, right, part of it is uh, Freire is pretty consistent, right? What he's trying to uh, explain to us through Fanon and through Albert Mimi, right, two people who had studied not simply uh, the colonial world, but also how does it create human subjectivities. Fanon from his psychoanalytical angle in Algeria and Albert Mimi also in Algeria but from his own experience of being someone in the middle because he was not Arab, he was Jewish, right? And as we read, the question is, you know, why do the natives turn against each other? Why does it become a point of pride for them to defend themselves, their honor, right? And obviously what Freire is hinting at and is, is wants us to understand is that the part of that psyche, as Fanon taught us, is developed within a very violent system in which there is a hierarchy. What is the hierarchy? That the public sphere is foreclosed to native men. They absolutely feel emasculated in it, right? So where do they turn then to express their manliness? Since the colonizer is all powerful and they've internalized it, right? They turn on each other. So the development of local gangs, crime gangs, being aggressive to fellow Arabs or fellow natives, that becomes the circle of their violence, right? Their aggressiveness, and that becomes the destructive mode of masculinity that they adopt. Even worst case, especially for peasants and others who absolutely feel powerful, powerless in the outside world, is that they, since they have internalized this duality that a relationship can only be of dominance and, and the oppressed, they then perpetuate that system within their family structures, against their children, against their uh, spouses and all. So what Memi, Fanon, and Freire are then teaching us is not just to individualize these actions and certainly not essentialize it as the colonizers did, right? Algerians and Arabs are violent, right? Uh, but to give an account of how does that subjectivity emerge. And what Freire is also saying is that it's not just that the natives and the peasants turn on each other, it's also that they have no faith in themselves. They have internalized this idea what the oppressors say about them, that they are lazy, they are stupid, they are uneducated, that even when you are working with them, right, they are looking for answers and they are very reluctant to think that they can think for themselves, right? And they would often use the vocabularies of describing themselves somewhere as dumb animals, right? And the last line in my reading was where they actually believe that animals are better than them because they are freer, right? So this self-deprecation, it's not just performative, it's deeply internalized, right? And how to, now remember, pedagogy of the oppressed is a pedagogy project. Right? It's a revolutionary pedagogy project which is not just trying to dispense knowledge to people who don't know things. It is trying to come up with a system of education that enables the practitioners of that education, the students, to learn themselves, but also in the process of learning that liberate themselves you know, from the manacles of the system in which their subjectivities were created, but also in the process liberate the oppressors themselves. So 
Um, and this meekness and submissiveness that the peasants and the students display, this deep respect for the teacher, this idea that teacher knows all things, right, is also part of that thing that's experience that they have internalized. More importantly, if you are from anywhere from the former colonies, think of it. Think of your students if you teach or when you were a student. How many times you sat in the class assuming that you are there to receive knowledge from the master, from the teacher? And, and, and very rarely would we dare to ask a question that challenged the authority of our teacher, even when sometimes they were wrong. Right? And part of the reason was that we had internalized that hierarchy, that we are ignorant, we don't know anything, we're not participants in our own education, and what the teacher dispenses, we take it, and then we become knowledgeable. And that applies to the classroom situation, but the actual real-life situations as well, and that's where Freire is taking us. So I'll continue reading on the next page. Uh, I think I had stopped... Uh, uh, here, um, you know, I had stopped in the middle of the page 63. I'll go to reading the next part and then come back to you in a few minutes after that. It is striking, however, to observe how this self-depreciation changes with the first changes in the situation of oppression. I heard a peasant leader say in a sentimiento meeting, they are respected as men. We are going to show everyone that we were never drunkards or lazy. We were exploited. As long as their ambiguity persists, the oppressed are reluctant to resist and totally lack confidence in themselves. They have a diffuse magical belief in the invulnerability and power of the oppressor. The magical force of the landowner's power holds particular sway in the rural areas. A sociological friend of mine, a sociologist friend of mine tells of a group of armed peasants in a Latin American country who recently took over a latifundium. For tactical re reasons, they planned to hold the landowner as a hostage, but not one peasant had the courage to guard him. His very presence was terrifying. It's also possible that the act of opposing the boss provoked guilt feelings. In truth, the boss was inside them. The oppressed must see examples of the vulnerability of the oppressor so that a contrary conviction can begin to grow within them. Until this occurs, they will continue disheartened, fearful and beaten, as long as the oppressed remain unaware of the causes of their condition. They fatalistically accept their exploitation. Further, they are apt to react in a passive and alienated manner when confronted with the necessity to struggle for their freedom and self-affirmation. Little by little, however, they tend to try out forms of rebellious action. In working towards liberation, one must neither lose sight of this passivity nor overlook the moment of awakening. With Within their unauthentic view of the world and of themselves, the oppressed feel like things owned by the oppressor. For the latter, to be is to have almost always at the expense of those who have nothing. For the oppressed, at a certain point in their existential experience, to be is not to resemble the oppressor, but to be under him, to depend on him. Accordingly, the oppressed are emotionally dependent. The peasant is dependent. He can't say what he wants. Before he discovers his dependence, he suffers. He lets off steam at home where he shouts at his children, beats them, and despairs. He complains about his wife and thinks everything is dreadful. He doesn't let off steam with the boss because he thinks the boss is a superior being. Lots of times the peasant gives vent to his sorrows by drinking. This total emotional dependence can lead the oppressed to what Fromm calls necrophilic behavior, the destruction of life, their own or that of their oppressed fellows. 
It is only when the oppressed find the oppressor out and become involved in the organized struggle for their liberation that they begin to believe in themselves. This discovery cannot be purely intellectual but must involve action. Nor can it be limited to mere activism but must include serious reflection. Only then will it be a praxis. So this was my reading from top of page 64 to the middle of page 65. And there are two terms that were I used in the reading, and one of them has a foot note on it, and that is ascent temieto, right? Ascent temiento, right? And that, uh, the root note raise, uh, is refers to a production unit of the Chilean agra agrarian reform experiment. Right, and and that's a group in which that conversation happened. So latifundium that was used later on that reading is any large estate holding by a large landowner. It comes uh, from the Roman system, but still is practiced in so many parts of the world. Now where we are headed in these passages that we just read, he's already given us an account of how the peasant, the oppressed are caught within the logic of the power system created by the oppressor class. What we are also learning is that they are so incorporated in that system that they, in that duality, that they think themselves worthless, not capable of learning new things. And they have started believing in the labels that were assigned to them by the colonizers and by the oppressors, being lazy, being negligent, being ignorant, right? They refer to themselves as such. And coming out of it is not going to happen through a natural teleological process. The awakening must be initiated through collaboration with others. And that's where education comes in, right? And the main thing to learn then is, of course, for the oppressed to become aware of the conditions of their own existence, right? Remember. This was the biggest question in early Marxism as well. How would the workers know of their own exploitation, right? Because ideology was masking that. So hence, you know, Lukács' theory of disalienation, Marx's own idea of how to create disalienated labor, all of that is geared towards how to convince the oppressed class to learn of their own true value, to learn of the system within which they are caught, and then try to change it, right? But learning that we exist in that system, that the oppressed exist in that system, is the key. That's the first point. And that happens in an encounter, in a study circle, or elsewhere for Freire, in a conversation, right, with the peasants where that light goes on where they suddenly realize, right, as, as I read previously, that they might have answers too, that most of what is happening to them is not accidental. It's actually constructed by the system in which they exist, right? What he's also trying to teach us towards the end of what I just read is the emotional dependence of the oppressed on the oppressor and the system and the oppressor system. I mean, think of it so much. I mean, it also happens a lot if they are part of the middle class, as we read earlier. Because so much of their life depends on the existing system, they are very reluctant to change it. Right? Think of the liberation movements or even general activism in our life right now. People who are poor, but they have learned through solidarity with others that they are being racially stereotyped, that they are being targeted. Since they have nothing to lose, it's easier to mobilize for them. But people who are somewhere in the middle class, their sympathies are already aligned with the elite, right? And they are the ones who would discourage their fellows, why are you rocking the boat? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Because they have internalized that they are on their path to becoming the dominant group. That's the problem of American politics all along, right? Other than race and everything else, that everyone lives in an elsewhere that's in the future, right? 
Now, what he's also saying is that this discovery of being exploited, it cannot just be intellectual. People can't be expected to sit and just think their way through. It has to be something that involves a praxis. It can't also be just activism, like mere activism where you just are fighting but don't know what you're fighting for. It must become a praxis, and it becomes a praxis by infusing theory, lived experience, learning from each other, and then developing a politics out of it. And that's where he's headed. Now remember, this is an educational project. But before he gives us the mode of education that he's going to explain in this book, he's telling us what this education is for. It is the pedagogy of the oppressed. But then he must define who the oppressed are. How do they become oppressed? Why do they think the way they do? Right? How not to administer knowledge to them? How to learn from them? And then how to acknowledge that the oppressed themselves will liberate themselves, but also liberate everyone else. And the only way to do it is to change the larger system within which this duality of oppressor-oppressed exists, right? But that change is not just going to happen because you, me, and everyone else wrote an essay about it or gave a lecture on it. That change is going to happen when we come together, figure out a way of eliminating the causes, right? That is the relationship of oppressor and oppressed, but also figure out a way where the oppressed learn of their own oppression and strive to change it, and in the process, change the system in which they exist. So much of what we read these days, decolonialism and decolonial thinking, is based in this mode of thinking, right? And the idea is, can we change the system if we function within it and think within its logic? Or do we need to come up with alternative modes of thinking, alternative modes of philosophy and praxis? That's what is at stake here. But do keep in mind, in the end, pedagogy of the oppressed is a pedagogical project. But this is a revolutionary pedagogy. This is a pedagogy that attempts not just to change people's perception of the world, but their existence in the world. So that's all I have today. I will come back, of course, the next lecture. I hope to conclude chapter one in the next conversation and then do a summary of what we have discussed in a separate lecture. Now, just for you to keep in mind, I have compiled the first 10 lectures in two videos. They're pretty long, I must warn you. But instead of going chunk by chunk, you can also watch those two compiled lectures on the channel right, in two sections. And then my hope is that the last part that I'll do to conclude chapter one will be in the third section. So the entire chapter one will then be in three large, long uh, videos. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, as always, please post them in the comment section and I will try to answer them. Please also subscribe to the channel so that you get timely notifications. And on a side note, we now have a full-fledged educational website with quite a few courses that we have already developed, some free, some paid. Please do check it out. It's called Cross-Cultural Learning, and the web address is masudraja.com. Thank you so much for today, and I will see you next time. Until next time, peace and love.